rests under the weight, the power, the glory of your word. And so, Lord, would you speak to us this morning? Would you speak a word of peace, a word of hope, a word of conviction, a word of encouragement, a word of salvation? Father, I pray for those in this room, but also perhaps those who are listening in online. Would you speak in a very clear and concise way? Holy Spirit, you are the teacher, so would you use me to encourage and exhort your people towards biblical faithfulness? We love you, and we consider it joy to be able to gather together to encourage one another. It's in the precious and mighty name of Jesus we pray, and all that agrees said, amen. If you don't mind making your way to Hosea, Hosea, you can, you'll find it in a few moments on the screen above me. Uh, the book of Hosea is where we're going to spend the next several weeks um, as we unpack this minor prophet. He just missed being kind of that major prophet, if you will, um, but a minor prophet, not because he had something less important to say, but because of the, the duration or the length of his prophecy, his prophetic words we have in these, um, in, the, in these chapters here in the book of Hosea. And so it's right after Daniel, uh, right before Joel, and you'll find these 14 chapters. Um, as, a, as a preacher or, or teacher, one of the things, um, or public speaker, we're always looking for is uh, illustrations. You know, um, you, you, you try to figure out a way, whatever your message, whether you're preaching or whether you're speaking in the marketplace, um, when you're teaching people any type of uh, insight or truth, uh, one of the things your, your attempt is to try to connect with the audience by giving them uh, illustrations or these dots, if you will, to hang that truth upon. And one of the challenges as a preacher is to always try to figure out an uh, illustration to give to ultimately connect you into a more modern context of God's word. And that's not always required. By all means, a lot of scripture, it is just very sto written in story form. Um, but, but, but I think about illustrations perhaps I've shared throughout the years. And uh, when I thought about that, I was thinking about like, man, illustrations are good uh, when you're on the other side of the lesson you were being taught in the illustration. Um, illustrations are good even for those who are hearing the illustration and you can sit back and say, huh, well, I'm glad that's not me or maybe I remember when I was in a season like that and you can kind of, it calls you to kind of somewhat kind of contemplate. Um, but what I, what I think about this book of Hosea is like, man, God gives him an illustration of the hardest kind. Because illustrations are good when it's somebody else's life, but not so much when it's yours. And so as we read these, as we spend time over the next couple of weeks working through these 14 chapters, this, this snippet, if you will, in the summation of the life of Hosea, um, I want to invite us into this illustrative lesson of his life. But I really want to pause and, and pray. My prayer is that each of us will rest under the weight of what, um, what God reveals about himself uh, in this book of Hosea. The reason we wanted this to kind of be uh, a, a book we work through is because we're on the heels of, of, of Easter. And I think as we look at Hosea's life, we're going to see how um, my prayer is this will make us more ready, not just for Easter, but just make us just good Christ followers. There are books in the Bible that are, that are PG, but then there are books that are rated R. You know, the, the cute ones where it's a lot more colorful, elementary-type language and story. Hosea is not one of those books. It's completely R-rated. The language and the imagery and, and the message and the example that God is, is making through Hosea's life is one that we must not pass by too quickly because we miss out on some of the weight that God wants to invite his children to sit up under. And so this morning, as we start off, we're going to look at chapters one through chapter number three of the book of Hosea. And one of the things you cannot help but see throughout this book is, man, God really hates sin. 
That's something we don't talk a lot about. That's something we don't like to, to grapple with in our day and age. But one of the things you can't help but see in this book is, man, God really hates sin. When's the last time you thought about that? Man, like, like God really hates sin. But I don't want to leave you there because the other side of the spectrum Hosea gives us is God really loves sinners. It's not either or, it's both and. God really hates sin, but also we see in this book, God really loves sinners. And so the big idea I want to lay before us, we're going to un unwrap over the next couple of weeks as we explore, which I would say is probably the theme of this book is, is that God's wrath and love are both offensive. God's wrath and love are both offensive. This is what we must understand um, to love and respond to God correctly. His wrath and love, they both have no rival. God's wrath is more dreadful than we could imagine, and yet his grace is more relentless than we, could, we deserve. It's both and, and we live constantly in that tension. God's wrath, it is actually more dreadful than you and I could ever imagine. We see that on the cross from a snippet. But yet his love is much more relentless than we ever could even perceive. God loves sinners, but he really hates sin. One will either be offended into or out of the kingdom because God's wrath and love are both offensive. Little context. Hosea is the first prophet of grace. His name actually means salvation. Some pronounce the book as O oh, see her because it is the parable of the prodigal wife. His wife, Gomer, her name means complete. He was called to feel the grief of God and the relentless love of God by God working through an extremely difficult marriage. His wife, Gomer, a woman of reckless inhibition and careless enjoyment of sin, yet God moves on Hosea's heart to pursue her in the most unusual of ways. Hosea was to seek her return, pay for her restoration, and romance her that she might truly love him back. Hosea, this prophet, if you read his story, we get a bleak, a bleak picture in this text, but yet also we get a beautiful example of hope. It's been said that love is blind and marriage is an eye-opener. You see so many shows on TV today that has to do with love and falling in love, but then when they enter the other side of marriage, they start to realize how costly love is. Love is so much more than emotional response. It is so much more than what I like or dislike about the person. Love, true love, as God intends, is one that the Bible will put it this way, it covers a multitude of sin. And so we see Hosea not having to just think this out, but to live this out as he pursues his wife. There's three, it's really two main points, and one I'm going to go a little bit deeper on. I want to give us as we work through these first three chapters of Hosea. The first one we see as the author opens up in verse number one. And it's this right here. When things are going right, we are most vulnerable to get it wrong. When things are going right, it is then that you and I are most vulnerable to get it wrong. Verse number one in the text, it says, The word of the Lord, which came to Hosea, the son of Beri, Beri, Beri. During the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joaz, king of Israel. Now, to set the stage for this, I love how Hosea, as he's writing, he's calling attention to when he walked the earth, when his prophecy would rule and be ushered out. What he's given us are the little contextual clues if you go back and read in 2 Chronicles. And you see what was happening in Israel during that time. 
What's significant to note is these were not times when things were going bad for Israel. But as a matter of fact, they were the polar opposite. It was a day where Israel was experiencing uh, much blessing, if you will, from the Lord. They were prospering. There were good days. There was more than enough bread. But yet what we also see and why Hosea is given this prophecy is much like Israel, we have a tendency to abandon God when things are going well. Have you ever noticed how little you seek the Lord when things are going well? Think from this prophet, his, his life is summed up. The, the scripture was was, was guarded and protected to be preserved to usher to us so that we might be experienced caution, if you will, that when things are going right, it is then we are most vulnerable to getting it wrong. Unfortunately, with prosperity, as in Israel's day, there came moral decay. Israel, they forsook God and began to worship idols. And the book shows the depth of God's love for his people, a love that tolerates no rivals. But yet, at the same time, it shows us a God who must address sin. Have you ever considered this? We want God less when things are going right. It is then that we are most vulnerable to getting it wrong. In the heart of humanity, God, good days might be our greatest threat to intimacy with God. There's something about difficulty that causes us to be a lot more aware of our need for God. Let's be honest, as you watching social media or the media channels, all attention is turned to the various diseases that is, is starting to plague and, and ravage many parts of the world. Schools are shutting down, jobs are starting to decide on how they're gonna uh, you know, handle their employees. But I would encourage you and I to pause and first remember that God is sovereign. Should we be cautious? Yes, we should. But remember, remind yourself that God is sovereign. But also use this as an opportunity to really seek the Lord. I heard one preacher say, worry and worship requires the same imagination. Which one will you choose? Same imagination it causes, it requires you to worry about the outcome of maybe the, that relationship, that job situation, that sickness, that parent, whatever it is that has you, your mind preoccupied. The same amount of imagination required to worry about it is the same imagination that it takes to worship God. So instead of you thinking of what will, what you should be thinking is who is. What will happen, what might happen, what could happen, maybe you should consider and ponder and think about who is in control and what he has declared. Hosea, he, he opens this book letting us know a little historical tidbit about what was happening during that day. Israel, they're experiencing God's blessing, but much like us, because of God's hand, they stopped seeking God's heart. They became so occupied with the blessing, they forgot about the blesser. As a result, the next several chapters, we're going to see God using this prophet to remind Israel to come back to the God who was blessing them in the first place. When things are going right, we are most vulnerable to get it wrong. But in the next thing we're going to see in these several verses and chapters, I'm going to ask you to to, to, to roll with me and, and explore is God understands betrayal and therefore can comfort through betrayal. God understands betrayal and therefore can comfort through betrayal. Chapter number one, picking up at verse two, down to verse eight, it says, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry. For the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel, 
for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, name her Laruhamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel, that I will never forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them and deliver them from the bow, by the bow, sword, battle, horses of horsemen. When she had weaned Laruhama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, name him Loami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. So in second place in the text, it tells us that Hosea, He's given this, this kind of pre, um, this example from this illustration from the Lord saying, look, man, go, you know, Hosea, you got to marry this woman. We don't know at what point she entered harlotry, whether it was before or after the marriage. Scholars are divided on what, which idea based upon the text and even some of the ideas they see in other passages. But what we do know is Hosea's wife was unfaithful. The Bible tells us that God is going to use this unfaithfulness of his wife to remind him and them of the faithfulness of their God. It goes on. He's telling Hosea about how they would give birth to children and how God would tell them to be named these very difficult names, if you will. One name is I will no longer have compassion. In other words, no mercy. God says, name the first child no mercy because I'm done giving you mercy. If that's not enough, he says, well, when the second one come, name that child. I've abandoned you and essentially you are no longer my people. I'm taking my name off of you. I'm no longer allowing you to carry my name. I've, I've withdrawn my presence from you, if you will. You're no longer representative of me. So Hosea, he's carrying this message that he has to carry, but also live at the same time. But it grows even darker. That seems bad, but the text seems to get a little darker. In chapter number two, verses one through 13, it says, Say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Rahama, contend with your mother, contend, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. But let her put away her harlotry from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. I will strip her naked and expose her as on the day when she was born. I told y'all this was X-rated. I will also make her a life like, like a wilderness, make her like a desert land and slay her with thirst. Also, I will have no compassion on her children because they are children of harlotry. For the mother has played the harlot. She has conceived them, has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge her up, her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. And she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. For she does not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for bail. Therefore, I will take back my grain at harvest time, and my new wine in this season. I will also take away my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness, and then I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her out of my hand. I will also put an end to her, her gaiety, her, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbath, and all her, her, her festival assemblies. I will destroy her vines and fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. And I will make them like a forest, and the beasts of the field will devour them. I will punish her for the days of, of the bells, when she used to offer sacrifices to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry and follow her lover so that she forget me, declares the Lord. God understands betrayal. Hosea, he's, God is reminding him, saying, look, as you pursue your wife Gomer in this wayward state, yes, I want you to keep on providing for her. 
I want you to keep on taking care of her. This is a sign. This is a picture of my love and my pursuit of Israel. God understands betrayal. He says, look, she's thinking by her pursuing her lovers that that is how she's being kept. But what she failed to see behind the scenes is Hosea keeps showing up as he's providing for her. So it is with Israel. Their waywardness, they were going after these idols, these little gods, these false gods, but yet failing to see that the very God that was sustaining them was the very God they were betraying. God understands betrayal, and therefore he is able to comfort us through betrayal, not after we get out of it, not once we've avoided it, but right in the thick of it. When we feel rejected, when we feel forgotten, when we feel as if we've been stabbed in the back, right then and there, God is able to comfort. How is that? I believe it's because this, because betrayal connects us more to the heart of God. What we'll see in, in Hosea's response in his situation is how betrayal, it connects us more to the heart of God. He does that. We see that in three ways. Look what happened. God uses Gomer's betrayal to help him better understand the heart of God. We do this to God all the time. How might this be? Well, betrayal connects us more to the heart of God in three ways. First, we see the offensiveness of sin. We see how offensive our sin really is. We read this text, it's easy to read it from a judgment, judgmental posture. I can't believe her. Uh, when you read this, just sit down. I would encourage each of us over the next several weeks when we're walking through this, just take each week, just read through the book. Take a week, it's 14 chapters. It'll take you maybe 30 minutes, depending on the, some of us less than that. Some of us maybe a little bit longer. But just read through it because in it, it's easy to feel judgmental. I can't believe this wife would abuse her husband that way. I can't believe she would miss out on how much her husband loved her. And we can read it even from perspective like because God told Hosea to go get her, that maybe he was just being obedient and his heart wasn't involved. I don't believe that's at all the case. I believe Hosea really loved his wife based upon some of the contextual clues of the text. It wasn't an act of like, okay, God, I'm just going to endure, have long suffering and keep showing up. No, I believe it was because he, his heart was broken for Gomer. And it's easy to read this text and be like, man, how in the world could she be so foul, so trifling? That's one angle. That's one way that you can easily read the text. But I believe if you read it and you stop there, you miss out on the beautiful, marvelous invitation God is inviting you and I into. Because though we see God hates sin, we also can't help but see how much God loves sinners. And betrayal, it connects us more to the heart of God in a couple ways. First, we see the offensiveness of sin. Sin is offensive in several ways, but we usually really only grasp it when we are the offended party. When you think about that, you're, you're really only, you really only rest and wrestle with the weight and, and consequences of sin when you are the offended party. When somebody has stabbed you in the back, when someone has done me wrong, when we feel offended, it's then that we really kind of wrestle with the, the consequences and the far-reaching effect of sin when you've been offended. But when you're calling in the offense, it's easy to pass by and want grace and feel like people should forgive you and extend grace to you when you are the one causing the offense. But there's something about being offended that helps you to see sin just a little bit better from God's perspective. In this story, we see how offensive Gomer's actions are towards Hosea, but what it should do is help us to see how offensive our actions are towards God. 
It should help us to rest under the weight of what it costs God to buy us back, to purchase us, because we too are sinners. And yet this holy God chooses to love us. Betrayal, as painful as it is, some of you in here right now, perhaps you're feeling betrayed. Perhaps you're feeling like, man, someone has wronged you and it's hard for you to forgive and let it go. Brothers and sisters, the hope in this text is that perhaps that is a marvelous invitation from the Lord. Inviting you to get a, a healthier perspective of your sin, but also his grace. Betrayal connects us more to the heart of God. How? Because we see the offensiveness of sin. But then the second thing is, it connects us to the heart of God because we long for justice. We long for justice. Think about it. Think about it. When you read this, you're thinking like, okay, yeah, okay, I want to see, man, justice come. When you read about what's happening around the world, when you read about what's happening uh, in the city, when you see an injustice take place, there is something inside of all of us, I hope, that causes you and I to want to see justice. I want to see that person repaid. We live in Atlanta, and Atlanta is a place full of different types of drivers. If you're like me, Especially it seems like here lately, it seems like all the bad drivers are just trying to just get up under my skin. I mean, it's like every time I'm on a road, somebody just speed by and they're just kind of putting my life in danger and everybody else in danger just kind of get almost like feels like six inches from just cutting me off. My flesh in that moment wants justice. May even think for a thought, Lord, I just pray there's a cop right there. Because, God, they, justice would be them getting pulled over. Because not only are they endangering my life and their life, they're endangering everybody else on the road. Any of you all ever thought that? We want justice. That there is something about being offended that causes you and I to recognize that, man, there is something broken around us. And we want justice. There are moments in life where we can become so complacent, so content with circumstances, and then we become hurt or offended or we see an injustice and we realize, like, man, no, no matter how much hope, no matter how much good I do, there will still be injustice. What should I do? That, I believe, is a beautiful invitation from the Lord. It's because, man, in that brokenness, we start to long for justice. But the justice, I know a lot of times I ask for, I'm the benefactor of it. I say this often, like I don't pray when I'm speeding for everybody to get a ticket. I just pray I don't get one. You never see anybody falling behind a police officer saying, look, I was speeding too. You should have gotten me. <laughs> no, no, no. Because justice is only really good justice if it benefits me. Hosea, Hosea in the text, we see here he is having to live out this illustrative lesson in his own life, pursuing his wife, who seemingly wanted very little to do with him. And God uses his life as an illustrative lesson saying, look, Hosea, I want you to keep paying for her, keep bailing her out, keep pursuing her, because in that you get a chance to see my heart and how my people treat me. Betrayal connects us more to the heart of God because we see the offensiveness of sin, but then also we start to long for justice, and no matter how much justice this world offers us, it would never be enough. We realize the brokenness of this world, this fallen world. But then this is the good news of the text. Is betrayal... It connects us more to the heart of God because we become more grateful for grace. We become more grateful for grace and God's mercy. I love it because in both all three of these chapters, we see God saying how he's going to punish Israel. But it's almost like Hosea is kind of bipolar, if you will. 
Because he's saying God is going to he's going to rain his wrath upon Israel. But then you have these breadcrumbs, if you will, of how God is still going to extend mercy. How God is still going to show up in a special way to reclaim his people. He says in chapter number one. Verse seven, he says, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God. And will not deliver them by the bow, sword, battle horses or horsemen. Jumping down to verse number 10, verse 11, verse 10, 11 says, yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people. It will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God and the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader and they will go up from the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. In chapter number two, I read those first 13 verses, but look how he closes out in chapter number two, verse 14 on through. He says, therefore, behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Acre as the door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth. As in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt, he says, look. Yes, I'm going to pour out my wrath, but also in the midst of it, I'm still going to pour out my grace. And he goes on to explain to them how God is going to show up and reclaim his people. He continues in chapter number two in that day at verse 18. In that day, I will also make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow the sword and war from the land and will make them lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. He says, look, yes, I'm going to chasten you. Yes, I am going to discipline you, but know that I will not forget you. In chapter number three, it goes on to say, verse number three, it says, Then I said to her, You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So I will also be toward you, verse four and five. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. idols. Afterwards, the son of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God, and David, their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Hosea, as you give this prophecy, yes, tell them about my chastening and my correction and my discipline. But Hosea, let them know also I'm still a God of mercy and grace. See, betrayal has this unique way of connecting us to the heart of God because we long, we see the offensiveness of our sin. We start to long for justice, but if we keep on persevering, if we keep on seeking his heart, we can't help but be, become more grateful for his grace. If you and I, if we reflect long enough on true justice, then you and I will ultimately, ultimately realize that the very justice you and I are asking for is the very justice that God has saved us from through Christ. Betrayal connects us more to the heart of God. I love how even in all of these hard words, in the book of Hosea, he does not lead us without hope. You can't help but see the breadcrumbs, if you will, to the true and better Hosea, the true and better Hosea that Hosea is meant to point to. God gives Hosea some breadcrumbs to ensure that though he may feel helpless, he doesn't have to be hopeless. Upon hearing this pronouncement, look at the breadcrumbs he provides. Said in verse chapter number one, verse seven, 
He says, look, in essence, like, look, the compassion I'm still going to extend to the house of Judah. Verse number 10, he says, yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured. God says, look, Hosea, I am not going to leave you this way. He says, I want to leave you with some hope in the mess, midst of your circumstance that seems to be. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. But then those passionate words we see in chapter number three, verse four and five. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or household idols. It sounds like the intertestamental period from Malachi to Matthew, where God goes silent for about 400 years. And Israel feels as if God has abandoned them. Hosea, this prophet who would come quite a few hundred years earlier, about 700 plus years earlier, is given this reminder of a true and better David that ultimately he was pointing them to. This would be a king who would love his people, not just to life, but all the way into death. This true and better king, this breadcrumb, if you will, that Hosea leaves, it points us to John chapter number six, the bread of heaven. The one who would come 700 some years later to remind God's people that they had not been forgotten. To remind God's people that forgiveness was available. To remind you and I that even when we're experiencing betrayal, it invites us to the heart of God to learn that this God who is compassionate towards us can counsel us through being compassionate towards others. Hosea, he gives us a picture of this true and better prophet who would come later on. I wanted us to spend time in this book. Because it's easy to walk with the Lord and co cultivate a heart of self-righteousness. It's easy to walk with the Lord and start to feel a certain way and start to, to look at your life, your morality, if you will, and to start to look down upon others. But my prayer is that we not just read this book, but from this book it will awaken grace upon grace in our own lives. Some of you, to be honest, you're right now, got a list of people you're already planning to write off. And rightfully so, naturally speaking, because you feel completely betrayed. There are people you're planning to block via social media or maybe from calling you because you've been greatly offended. I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do, but I just want to invite you to just sit in this text and, and rest under the weight of how much God hates sin. But don't just stay there. At the same time, rest under the weight of how much God loves sinners. You see, God, his wrath and his love are both offensive. And one of the things we can't help but see in this passage is the whole reality. It will either offend you into or out of the kingdom. You decide. As we prepare for Easter, my prayer for us is that, man, we will be a church that in our own way we're living we're pursuing the loss with this relentless type of love like Hosea had to pursue his wife, Gomer. We're pursuing those who are hurting, those who want nothing to do with Jesus before we came into, the light, into their life. Perhaps something we may say or do may cause them to be a little bit more open to the gospel. My prayer for us as the Midtown Bridge Church is that we would truly be a family pursuing the mission of Jesus. I'm confident there is somebody around you 
They need to experience. They need to encounter this relentless love of the Lord. And God invited you into their sphere of influence for you to be that banner, to be that illustrative teaching, if you will, of how much God hates sin, while at the same time, how much God loves the sinner. Will you choose to be that example? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. 